status quo policy of granting lifetime tenure to Supreme Court justices is disadvantageous for three reasons. First, Supreme Court justices are serving for much longer terms than envisioned by the Founding Fathers. The first ten judges of the Supreme Court served on average for eight years. Um, since 1990, the average time served has increased to 26.3 years. The top five judges who have left the court have served longer than 26 years. Ginsburg for 27, Kennedy for 30, Scalia for 29, Stevens for 35, and Breyer for 28. The problem with life tenure, wrote journalist Stuart Taylor in 2019, is that some justices will remain in the court until mentally debilitated or at least past their prime, as did Justice William O. Douglas. Empirical evidence supports this point, as a study by the U Pitt law professor David Garrow identified 11 Supreme Court justices during the 20th century who experienced impaired mental capacity before vacating their seats. The second problem with life tenure is that appointments to the court are now rare, unpredictable, and allocated in an, inequ in an inequitable way. These factors have made the nomination process partisan and politicized. Future appointments to the court will be exceedingly rare, exceedingly rare according to a study done by David Fishbaum of the management consulting um, firm Oliver Wyman, reported in the Washington Post on September 22, 2020. Um, using standard statistical methods and assumptions, he estimated that there will only be 25 new Supreme Court appointments over the next century, compared to 47 in the previous 100 years and 60 between 1869 and 1969. Appointments are also unpredictable due to unplanned deaths and strategic retirements by judges. As a result of these random events, the composition of the Supreme Court does not accurately reflect the outcome of Democratic elections, and Republicans have nominated a disproportionate of number of judges. Daniel Epps, a Washington law professor, wrote in 22, even though Democrats controlled the White House for 20 of the 52 years between 1968 and 2020, happenstance and other factors meant that Democrats appointed only four justices during that time, while Republicans appointed 15. Um, due to the rarity and unfairness of the allocation of Supreme Court seats, the confirmation process is partisan and dysfunctional. Alicia Bannon and um, Michael Malaw of Cordova of the Brennan Center at NYU Law observed in 23, that nominees are increasingly confirmed on near party line votes regardless of their underlying merit. And Chief Justice Roberts is the only sitting justice who have received the support of a majority of senators not in the nominating president's political party. The dysfunction of the process becomes evidence when Republicans refuse to even allow a vote on Merrick Garland. This radical step, Bannon and Cordova observed, um, broke a norm of more than 100 years to evaluate every Supreme Court nominee's fitness for office. A third problem with life tenure is that it's more likely to produce a court with extreme ideological imbalance. This is starkly evident today where you have a Supreme Court dominated by six conservative justices. Um, this happened due to untimely deaths, strategic retirements, and Senate obstruction. But today's situation is not an anomaly. In fact, it's a norm of life tenure. An empirical study conducted by um, Chicago law professor Adam Shilton and published in the Sun Southern California Law Review in 21 examined how extreme ideological imbalance defined as having 75% or more of the seats on the Supreme Court um, appointed by one party exists under life tenure compared to term limits. The study found that from 1937 to 2020, under life tenure, the ideological imbalance existed 59.5% of the time. In contrast, the study found that 18-year 18 18 term limits would have reduced um, ideological imbalance by 50%. Having imbalanced courts harmful for several reasons. First, it leads to doctrinal instability. We've witnessed that over the past two terms where conservative-dominated courts have reversed long-standing precedents on abortion, affirmative action, guns, and voting rights. Second, the court loses democratic legitimacy when it issues rulings which are consistently outside the mainstream of public opinion. Bannon and Cordova of Brennan Center observed that public confidence in the court is plummeted due to issuing rulings which are unmoored from the values of the American public. Polling by both Gallup and Pew found that Americans have the lowest trust in the Supreme Court since they began polling in 1972. Loss of court legitimacy is really dangerous because it erodes respect for rule of law. Law professor Epps warned in 22 that for social peace, we need people to believe that it's better to continue living under existing arrangements um, however imperfect. This is, this is a necessary prerequisite to having a rule of law. To solve for these harms of life tenure, the affirmative team advocates for the adoption of the term limits reform plan outlined in 23 by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And according to the American Academy, um, the plan would involve the following details. Future presidents would appoint two new justices per term, um, giving presidents flexibility regarding the timing of their nominations would prevent impasses in the Senate. Um, justice would serve Justices would serve actively for 18 years, after which they would remain in office but take senior status with a diminished role, um, diminished set of duties. The current Supreme Court justices would be permitted to remain in active service as long as they wish. This would temporarily expand the court. Ultimately, however, the court would stabilize at nine justices and remain at that size indefinitely. In the event of an unexpected vacancy, a new justice would be appointed to fill the remainder of that term. After Chief, Ju Chief Justice Roberts leaves the bench, the Chief Justice role would be um, Protected by a vote of sitting justices um, appointed under this new system, and then justices appointed by the system would remain in office for the purposes of good behavior clause even after the conclusion of their 18 years in active service. This system can be implemented by statute without running afoul of the Constitution. The American Academy plan is devised by leading legal scholars, and the plan will, re will reduce partisanship, restore legitimacy, and preserve judicial independence. 
Al um, Allison Durkee wrote in Forbes Magazine in October 25th, 23, a working group of scholars at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences would establish 18 year term limits for Supreme Court justices. Doing so would preserve judicial independence while improving the court's reputation and reducing the incentives for strategic retirements and political campaign st style efforts Focus on the nomination process. Setting an 18 year term limit is in line with how long the average justice has historically served on the court. I mean, presidents would be able to predictably appoint two justices per term, with no single president able to, rejoin, to appoint a majority of justices on the court. With the group predicting it would take until 2047 for there to be nine justices on the court, the working group's members include experts such as U.S. Circuit Judge Diane Wood, Harvard Law Professor Charles Freed, and scholars from Yale, Georgetown, Harvard, and Penn Law. Um, I stand open for thoughts, as I should be here. Constitutional amendment or something like that. Um, as we said in our case, we don't have to amend the constitution, constitution to do our plan. It would just be letting presidents appoint two new justices, and temporarily it would expand the court, but in the long term it would stabilize it. Nine. Okay, so would this be a bill then, or would it be by executive order, or are you going back on the merits of implementation? Um, we'll answer that later. I don't have that off the top of my head. I just know we would not be changing the constitution. Okay. I'm sure that's fine. Uh, and I guess in that regard, so are you sticking with 18 year limits then? 18 year yeah. Limits? Okay. Um, perfect. Um, all right, let's see. Then I guess, right, so you talked about how this, like, you know, like, whole, like, advantage on, like, how, like, Republicans are, have been able to appoint more justices, right? But what happens if it happens to be, like, the opposite, right? Like, if Democrats were to appoint more justices, would you consider that to be, like, a good thing? Or, I mean, we're saying in general, this political imbalance is really bad, and we're trying to solve that by saying each new president would get two new appointments, and so in the long term, it'll balance out. Okay, got it. Um, so, yeah, so I guess, so you're not really saying that, like, Democrat justices would be better than Republican justices or anything like that, right? We're just trying to find judicial balance. Uh, love you, by the way. Okay, so that includes appointments from both Republican and Democratic presidents, or I guess whatever future political party may yeah. be in the United States. Okay, fantastic. Um, all right. Um, so then I guess continue on to that then, right? So then, like, let's say, like, if, w are you concerned about, like, because, like, the 18 years, like, doesn't, every single two years, with all that stuff, would you be considered, concerned that, like, literally one two-term president could ultimately appoint four justices and pretty much create a majority on the court? I mean, no, we're saying long-term it would balance out. I don't really get what you're asking with that question. Yeah, okay, so I guess, right, because you're saying every single two years a new justice will be appointed, correct? Not every, I mean, yeah, like, during one term, yeah, like, yeah, okay, so that means every successes. single every single term of a presidency, there would be two new justices appointed. Yeah. Okay, so then one two-term president could appoint four justices, correct? I guess, yeah, but I mean, it's still say like longer term, it would balance out. Like it doesn't really make a difference. Right, but yeah, so in terms of this like quote unquote longer term, it could balance out. But like theoretically, even in the short term, right? Like even in just one year, the Supreme Court can take a lot of very consequential decisions, can it not? I mean, I would say no. I mean, right now, I'd say the status quo is pretty bad, so I wouldn't really say it would be any worse. Okay, right, but this, if the status quo is pretty bad, it, um, right, but then theoretically, okay, I guess first clarification, why would you say the status quo is bad? I would say we have judicial imbalance and the status quo is kind of like what we're arguing. Right now, it's dominated by conservative judges, not necessarily trying to call out a party, but I'm just saying, like, right now, it's dominated by one political party, pretty clearly. And then that's been bad for policies such as, like, abortion, affirmative action, etc. Okay, so then I guess at HCU, like pretty much only a 4-5 or 5-4 court would be acceptable, and that would be considered balanced? I mean, something like that. I wouldn't say only, but yeah, I would say generally we're just trying to find like the most moderate, politically balanced court possible. Sure. Okay, so like let's just say like this plan like gets implemented today, right? And like Joe Biden, like, I don't know, maybe he gets more in there, uh, or like, right? And then like, but then what happens if like the Republican president is elected again, right? And this theoretically could become like a 7 or 8 
a conservative. I mean, I'd say in the I first, I mean, like, maybe, but I'd still say it's, like, the exact same thing insofar as one party has the majority and can kind of do what they want. I would say it's really no different. Right, but then with seven or eight, just, like, for example, conservative justices, doesn't it make it much more difficult and or take much more time for any future theoretical Democratic president to be able to overturn it, i.e., like, the Demo Democrats would have to, like, win, like, multiple elections in a row. I'm in sure. I mean, at the end of the day, I'd also just say, like, this is just kind of speculation. Like, you can't really even say, like, which party will win. Like, you can't really reasonably predict that. So, like, okay. it's just, like... Sure, I mean, that's pretty much it all. That's just straightforward. Yeah, cool. All right, cool. speech, I'm going to first respond to some of the arguments and then we'll provide one of our own uh, one of our own contentions. So first they talk, talk, they talk to you about age. Um, we tell you that age of justices doesn't actually impact core quality or productivity. Um, there is robust uh, empirical model analyzing amount of cases heard by justices in, in reference to the age finds that there is no statistical correlation between age of a judge and declining, pro declining productivity. And uh, this is there's this research by this guy named Joshua Edelbaum, um, who works at the Georgetown University Law Center that said, on the whole, the results uh, of this article do not provide clear support for the assertion that increased longevity in terms of service of the justices have resulted in a decline of, in the productivity of the court as measured by the number of cases accepted for review and the number of opinions issued per term. This article cautions against relying too heavily on this claim to support the SCRA and other recent proposals to impose term limits for Supreme Court justices. Then they tell you about polarization. We tell you that term limits ensure increased polarizations, confirmation delays, de decreased legitimacy, and a host of other issues. So in uh, uh, according to a study by uh, Harvey Wilkinson III, um, who is a former United States Circuit Judge on the Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit, um, imposing term limits on Supreme Court justices is a terrible idea because terms, however spaced and staggered, will cure none of the faults and only exacerbate weaknesses. They will make the institution appear more political. Confirmation battles will become numerous, long enough to inflame partisan passions. A change would leave court shorthanded if uh, confirmation delay set in. It is easy to imagine the strategic games justices uh, may be tempted to engage in smuggling a uh, president, uh, overruling it before so and so leaves the bench. What happens when a justice dies or retires before the ex expiration of his or her term? As for danger of justices with the decline, declining mental powers remaining on the court, there exists a plethora of internal and external pressures that can readily de be deployed. The rolling, revolving door breeds enormous cynicism, uh, and the dignity of individual justices is, is essential ideal of judicial independence. It seems inevitable, inevitable that an elite, elite institution will suffer discontent. Institutions instituting term limits will invite more dangerous alterations of the court structures. Uh, uh, now a, a turn. Uh, term limits amplifies ugly confirmation hearings and incentivizes revenge appointments and structural factors that make the court hearings political and don't change by making them more frequent. Uh, uh, according to a study by Calantri, uh, who is um, works uh, on the on the Supreme Court and wrote for like an international journal, um, term limits do not solve politicization of court fixed terms make unappealing features of the confirmation process worse and attaches nominating chances to president uh, to presidency and create more natural cycles of revenge uh, to make hearing uglier and more frequently increases courts pr uh, prominence in every election cycle nominations are controversial because SCOTUS judges justices revolve resolve uh, highly important public issues uh, stakes in any nomination will remain highly contentious uh, and sometimes ugly hearings
Uh, and now I will s skip to um, the uh, we'll sk skip to judicial independence. Um, so, so judicial U.S. judicial independence is still ranked among the top in the world, but it is on the brink. Uh, according to a study by Alexander Hudson, um, in uh, on how independent is the Supreme Court. Uh, political backlash to court's rulings raises questions about the court's power, court's independence. How U.S. Supreme Court compares to other countries. Data in 173 countries <laughs> show that courts in the USA were among the most independent in the world. The USA was solidly in the top 25% globally. Justices who have protection through life tenure behave independently and aren't susceptible to influence from external sources. Uh, uh, cri the critical issue is the meaning of judicial independence and as a normative good in designing a judicial system protects uh, judges from undue interference. By examining judicial appoint appointees who have later been confirmed to full time, we can test pr uh, presence of judicial independence. Do protections of lifetime tenure provide judges with independence? We tell yes, judges did alter behavior, but after temporary judges are concerned with impressing, uh, their, impressing the pres presidents and that their actions on the bench uh, and because they, they need the president to renominate and support them. Um, thus, we tell you that the structural protection of co constitutional of constitution provides judges a certain amount of independence. Judges who do not uh, tailor rulings to preference of in, uh, um, judges will not tailor rulings to a preference of the electorate. Uh, judicial independence is key to environmental rule of law, specifically solve environment and climate change, according to a study by. Uh, uh, Rema and Kamari Mbote in 2020, uh, 2022, um, in in the in the Stockholm 97, uh, yeah, uh, by by these two people says that prolifer proliferation of environmental law around the world, uh, thousands of multilateral and bilateral agreements. The principal challenge is effective implementation. Supreme Court justices around the world, uh, were, this is the first time Supreme Court justices around the world had the opportunities of working uh, of for realizing the promise of environmental rule of law and importance of judicial independence. Judges play a critical role in responding to biodiversity loss, climate change, and pollution. Judicial implementation of environmental law are essential components for achieving a healthy climate. Uh, you're good to talk? Yes. Sorry, Pat. So let's start on talking about the term that you read about, like, term limits incentivizing revenge. Essentially, you're just saying, like, this will become a political issue, like, in the future as the presidents, like, feel their nominee, like, as a voting issue? Uh, or, like, what are you trying to argue with that? Well, I think what we are trying to say here is that um, if you uh, get, if you enable term limits, that the, the presidents, uh, yeah, essentially, yeah, that's what we're saying, um, the president would they, they will be able to take revenge on the previous okay. judges. Uh, based on their actions. But, okay, sure. So then wouldn't you say this is already happening in the status quo? Uh, well, we tell you that, okay, sure, there's probably not a way to completely prevent this, but we tell you that this is a lot less likely in the status quo because you're not uh, able to appoint as many justices as often as you are able to with term limits. Okay, so do you know what Joe Biden did when he was running? Like, a, a burger on the Supreme Court. He essentially wielded Kamala Harris and like, I'm going to appoint her if I get the chance to. So essentially, wouldn't you say like this is already a political issue given that that's happened in the past? Um, also, Trump did it too. Like a bunch, like the president before him also did it. Like it's a pretty common occurrence. Well, I mean, for, first of all, it, like sure, jo Trump did it. Uh, you said Joe Biden tried to appoint Kamala Harris. He didn't because there's not an opportunity to do so. We tell you the incentive sure could exist, but we tell you it's a lot less likely. I just okay. Just sort of I'm just saying it's already a political issue. But anyways, let's go to something else. Um, you talk about polarization being increased in the short term. Um, yeah, I guess like death and like expiration date. Like, oh yeah, and then you say it's a revolving door. Wouldn't you say like it's kind of the same thing in the status quo? Like, someone dies, you get a new appointment. It's also like pretty random. I feel like public perception would be the same under a term limit system. No, like I don't see what's different here. Well, uh, again, like you know, like sure, this issue could possibly still exists in the status quo, but we're telling you it will be exacerbated again in your world because it's, also, it's more likely to occur more often, and the public image of this will be worse. So out of curiosity, how would it be like, more often that like, a justice is just going to like die out of the blue? I don't know. Like, I don't see how we increase that. I don't see the correlation. Uh, well, okay, maybe not necessarily die, but there are a lot of other things that could 
need to adjust it getting like uh, removed off the core is more three point eight millimeter or less. Okay, sure, whatever. Um, let's move to something different. You talk about like age and productivity. I guess how does that actually address what we're saying? So I think what you're trying to say here is that age and productivity is just like negatively correlated. The older that you get, the less productive that you get. We tell you first of all that is not the case according to our empirical studies and. Secondly, like as you get older, you probably get more experience dealing with poor cases. Therefore, you'll probably become a better judge. Okay, sure. Um, I would say under our system, like you solve for mental capacity and empiric setting. That's another issue entirely, but y'all can address that later. Um, finally, let's go to the thing that you started talking about, like judicial independence um, and like environmental law. I guess you would agree judicial independence is like a good thing, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, Actually, wait, where was I going with that? That wasn't really what I wanted to say. Um, about judicial independence, you compare the US to a bunch of other country, like a bunch of other countries. What exactly do these other countries have to do with our situation? No, what we're trying to say is that the US judicial independence is among the best in the world, which is essential to uh, democracy and like implementing like laws like preventing climate change. And we're telling you that because we have judicial independence um, with, without term limits, like term limits will decrease the judicial independence of the okay. US. Like sure, but like even if the U.S. like ranks pretty highly, I wouldn't say like that says anything about judicial independence being good in the status quo. Like let's say every country lives under a dictatorship. Even so, like if one dictator is a little more democratic, I would still say it's a dictatorship. No. Uh, sure, but like that's not the essence of our case, right? We're just trying to tell you that like judicial independence, uh, like term limits, is not good for judicial independence. But we tell you there are other benefits of judicial independence. Okay, sure, that's fine. Thank you. team advocates for the adoption of 18-year term limits as outlined in 2023 by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Under this plan, presidents appoint two new justices each term, and justices serve actively for 18 years and then afterwards can remain in office for senior status. Under this system, justices remain in office for the purposes of good behavior even after their active service. This term limit, as, um, as explained in the, in the first affirmative speech, reduces partisanship it restores legitimacy of the, of the court and preserves judicial independence, the harms recognized during the first affirmative speech. Um, to address the issue of the adoption of the plan during cross-examination, um, I wanted to explain that this plan can be adopted by a congressional issue. Our evidence from the Acad American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the 1AC um, says that Supreme Court justice, judges can continue to serve as senior judges in the federal courts after their 18-year terms are up. They don't vacate their office, and therefore, once again, like I've mentioned, the good behavior clause is not violated. Um, now on to um, answer the, um, the arguments in the first negative speech. Um, the first argument is talking about age not having an impact on the court's productivity. However, I'm going to list a few examples um, from the past of how that is not the case. Examples of mentally um, impaired judges include William O. Douglas, who despite suffering a debilitating stroke in 1974, refused to retire. His colleagues deferred voting on any cases in which Douglas's vote might make a difference. An example that productivity has been undermined by an aging and unpaired judge, and, and an impaired judge. A more recent example is of declining health of Thurgood Marshall, who served for 24 years. In his final years on the bench, he lost his hearing and became confused during oral, oral arguments about which side the attorneys were representing. Lastly, Chief Justice um, Reskin, who served for 33 years, refused to retire even after receiving a terminal diagnosis of thyroid cancer. In his final year, Rehnquist missed 44 um, oral arguments and had trouble completing his sentences. These examples show that the aging of justices, as well as justices serving past their prime, 
um, has an impact on the court's productivity. Under, your, under the affirmative plan, 18-year term limits allows the judges to work, at, to work at their prime and also incentivizes younger justices to be elected. Years of experience don't get anyone anywhere if, what, if there are other factors that um, cause loss of mental capacity. Next is our argument um, on um, polarizing hearings. Um, term limits with, regularly, with regularized op opponent, opon appointments will decrease partisan fighting during a confirmation hearings. This is from um, Fisher Law, um, Jeffrey L. Fisher, a law professor at Stanford. Why should um, we favor a system that would result in more confirmation hearings? The whole point of term limits would be to regularize the appointment and confirmation process. To make the nominations of new justices more unremarkable and lower the temperature, the reform would curb our worst instincts. Term limits with regular appointments will lessen the contentiousness of confirmation. This is from Tyler Cooper, a senior researcher at Fix the Court. Um, critics suggest that if, um, establishing term limits would result in more frequent high octane confirmation battles, but that, that ignores the history of confirmation battles and fails to take into consideration how a predetermined term of service, the guarantee of subsequent appointments in the near future would lessen, lessen any uh, consequences of one appointment and would take some fire out of um, confirmation hearing battles. On to um, their, their argument on judicial independence. Um, the um, negative team has um, stated that, um, that um, term limits um, undermines judicial independence. However, a decline in court legitimacy and the status quo currently is a greater threat to judicial independence than enforcing term limits would be. Um, this is uniquely worse for the environmental harms that were posed in the 1 and 2. This is from um, Alicia Bannon and Milov um, Cordoba um, from the Brennan Center for Justice at New York University School of Law. The court's independence relies on public perceptions of its legitimacy. Other branches respect for its role in decisions. There is a good reason to believe that the current system cur actually threatens judicial independence. Strategic retirements and raw power politics during the confirmation process invite attacks on the court's legitimacy and contribute to the public perception that the court is a partisan institution. Dysfunction in the, in the existing system can therefore threaten the, judi the court's functional independence. And 18-year um, term limits do not undermine judicial independence. This is from the, um, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, 18 years of active service followed by tenure status imposed by um, as a future uh, as a prospective matter on future justices um, and those not currently sitting does not undermine the independence of the judiciary. Um, the judicial independence requires that judges um, be free to decide cases without fear or favor, and 18 uh, year terms of active service um, do not promote that principle. And once again, um, once again. Um, um, this is um, this means that the status quo, um, the the court legitimacy and the status quo is uniquely worse um, for um, environmental policy than um, in, than um, in introducing term limits. Um, what, like we said in the one and C in the versus friends of speech, um, currently we have um, justices who um, are strategically retiring. Um, and refusing to hear certain cases that would harm um, their post their retirement plans, and also um, and um, also are um, um, and also at the same time, this undermines the public confidence in the court, and which also has effects on um, environmental policy. Um, and that's my time. So I'm open for. Start timing on my fourth question. So we talked about how uh, for this 18-year term limit, you can get reappointed based on good behavior. How do you think good behavior is going to get reappointed? Um, so that I'm talking about the good behavior clause, which basically states that um, judges can't, like that, are appointed to their seats can't like be removed without their own will. Um, what I'm saying here is that um, once ju um, judges are appointed to the court, they serve an 18-year active term, and then after that, they, um, if they choose to remain involved with um, the courts, they can um, they return to um, a senior status, and this has a diminished set of duties, so that they are still a part of the court under the good behavior clause, but do, um, do not have the same um, duties as they would as an active justice. 
Okay. Um, moving on to the next question. Um, you talked about how uh, old judges are losing their hearing or whatever, they're um, incompetent to keep serving on the board. And you're, you're saying that this 18 year term limit would get rid of this. Isn't 18 year a long time? I would say that 18 years is a long time, but like I mentioned, and like I mentioned, um, this also incentivizes younger, um, younger um, appointment or appointments to be made towards younger people. And so that means that if we have people that are being appointed at a younger age, they um, go like they kind of their term ends at an earlier age, and it still ensures that they're within their prime. Would you not agree that the presidents are more likely to appoint old people anyways because old people have more experience? There's, I mean, there's a chance that older people can still be appointed. However, um, there's, um, we, I, like I mentioned in, um, like I mentioned in my previous speeches, um, like there have been people that have been elected regardless of that kind of merit, anyways. Um, so, like I said before, there's still an incentive with 18-year term limits to um, elect people who are younger, um, due to the fact that um, once they are finished their term, they're at a younger age and can can continue either serving at the court or can seek other forms of employment. So you talked about other forms of employment. Um, if these people will get out of the Supreme Court and they're kind of like, um, and they need to find another job, would you not agree that during their term they're more likely to be susceptible to susceptible to corruption, such as you know uh, catering to the interests of some businesses because they're inclined to finding a job with these companies after they retire? Um, I would say that um, in response to like them finding other forms of employment that 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 is even that is even more of a risk um, today without um, term limits where um, where people where people are refusing to hear cases um, that determine and that have um, that can jeopardize their retirement plan uh, okay uh, and would you not agree that wouldn't that strategic re retirement that you're talking about get worse because justices are forced to retire Justices are not forced to retire under our AF plan. Like I mentioned before, um, they um, they um, can assume a senior status where they are still um, remain they still remain a part of the court, but have um, a lower um, set of responsibilities. Okay, yeah, that's good for us. That's fine. is not ready. All right, then you may begin time on my first point. All right, so first what we'll do today um, is I'll go back and go through some of uh, their points that they brought up and I'll bring up some points of rebuttal. And I'll also briefly bring up some points of new pieces of evidence that will extend our arguments, um, so on and so forth. Okay, so let's first begin with some of the things that they say in their speech, right? So first of all, uh, we can see that, right? Like they're talking about this whole like new like plan about where like you know they'll have these justices uh, retire or not. And we argue that this implementation of the plan like specifically, uh, this um, like you know that adds a lot of spec and it allows them to like kind of like um, what is it just frame out of a lot of our arguments, spike off a lot of our arguments. So at best we say that uh, because of this you can go ahead and air neg um, on this. Furthermore, uh, we can also see right. So then they also talk about right. Uh, you know, like that they will directly like vacate their office or whatever. Instead, they'll assume this quote unquote senior status, right? Two major issues with this. First, they can see it in cross. So it's entirely possible they don't assume the senior status, and they instead decide to go out and seek other employment. And in fact, the key thing here is we would argue that this is more likely. Why? Because when we specifically take a look at like you know exactly what this quote unquote senior status employs, right? We can see that like there is no guarantee of like payment or anything like that, right? All right. So there is no specific reason as to why this sort of uh, claw, uh, this sort of senior employment status would be preferable, especially when they can like, you know, a former Supreme Court justice, like becoming like a corporate lobbyist or like, you know, like that's how you make the big bucks, right? Like this is like exactly what like companies are looking for, right? They're going to be able to make so much more money in industry, right? Like this is why like you see like former senators like, you know, retire or like even resign from their positions earlier just so they can take a job in industry. It's because these positions are exactly too lucrative. Uh, and we argue that this would be exactly the same case for the Supreme Court justices and therefore they would have incentive to continue to go um, on to these other positions and not hold on to this like whatever like other like senior position unless if they're like really old or something. Um, but anyways, um, yeah, and, and in that case if they are really old then that also spikes into kind of like their uh, you know argument about them being really old in the first place, right? But on the topic of really old, let's talk about this, uh, their argument about like, you know, like uh, judges like, you know, um, 
being able to suffer. I feel like so, so they give you like three examples. Do you think that none of these examples are even in terms of like that recent memory? Because especially because of like new, like you know, more recent medical care. In fact, more recently, specifically, we can see that Supreme Court justices have not had access to the uh, care at the Walter Reed Medical Center, and uh, especially with the quality of care improving specifically for these justices, we argue that things are getting better, right? And even then, they can say like, oh, these judges like can't speak coherently or whatever, and that shows a cognitive decline. But we argue that that is explicitly not the case. In fact, my partner brought my partner brought this Tato Blom six evidence, which is past like you know like Thurgood Marshall and whenever all this stuff happened, which by the nineteen sixties, completely different era, right? But the point is, even if they uh, aren't like necessarily like you know, uh, even if it becomes more difficult for them to articulate their words, right? Um, uh, because of you know who knows thing, things that naturally come with aging, that doesn't mean that they still can't write perfectly good opinions, right? Because I mean, opinions take time to write, right? And they can't perfect this. They still have uh, other other aids. I, so on and so forth, right? So especially in the modern era, we argue that this impact is significantly uh, diminished at worst and uh, at best, at least for our side. Uh, it is really just uh, completely not relevant, right? Um, okay, next up, let's move on to this idea of like, you know, like the tension of the confirmation hearing, right? We argue that this is actually specifically more dependent on um, the justice that's being appointed and not necessarily based on like, you know, oh, when this is happening, why? It's because we can see recently between both Biden and Trump, like, right? Like for example, for Brett Kavanaugh and for Amy Comey Barrett, right? There were massive questions about their qualification. Brett Kavanaugh had a pretty big scandal, so on and so forth. While Ketanji Brown Jackson's appointed to the court, the best thing the Republican could come up with is that there's a more qualified candidate and she's supposedly a quote unquote diversity appointment or whatever, right? Because like, right, this fundamentally shows that the bottom line is that it just depends on the justice that's appointed. Even then, you can see like in the status quo, uh, confirmation hearings can be, um, you know, mostly uh, not really that relevant, right? Okay, um, so, um, yeah, so I guess, yeah, uh, now we can uh, go on to some points of new matter. Um, so I'll quickly go ahead and extend on this kind of like, you know, like judicial independence and like why, like, you know, lobbying and aspiration go on and so forth. Um, so yeah, a specific case study is India, right? Industry, in fact, India proved that judges can research officials to increase the chance of valuable employment, right? This is according to um, uh, an associate professor of the law at the Tiana University School of Law in 2022. They write that there's evidence that retiring uh, ISC Indian Supreme Court. Justices ruled more favorably towards the government in order to obtain prejudice prestigious post-retirement jobs with significant benefits. The Indian case study suggests that when judges leave the court at a young age, they're likely to see employment after their service. Term limited judges on SCOTUS may also pander to future employers, thus compromising judicial independence. While judges retiring from the ISC are prohibited from entering private practice, there's no such prohibit prohibition in the U.S. Retired judges would be very valuable to law firms for their understanding of SCOTUS and their experience. If retiring SCOTUS judges are not barred from private practice, there's also a possibility that they will use the context and knowledge about SCOTUS to inappropriately influence legal issues before the courts. Um, furthermore, we can also see that um, yeah, right, so this shows, um, right, specifically, even, like, with, like, protections from, like, you know, like, former Supreme Court justice of India from entering the private sector, they're still motivated. So within the United States, that would only get worse, and specifically within the key U.S. law system, uh, it's specifically why justices are going to be so valuable, right? Okay, now let's uh, talk specifically more about how uh, term limits uh, are, what happens with term limits, right? Continuing on this term, term limits actually specifically tie appointing justices to the president who wants them to directly tie together. That's according to Farnsworth 5. Another drawback of precisely um, allocating appointments to presidents is that they might increase the justice's sense of obligation to carry out the wishes of whoever appointed them. If everyone in those two seats are as loyal presidents want, those seats may be regarded as his to fill in a stronger sense than we currently see, and nominees may feel pressured to carry out his agenda. Uh, agenda. There will be Republican or Democratic appointees in a more explicit sense and view their own roles as more political. That ultimately depend that dependence undermines every single democratic principle of the Supreme Court. That's according to Cooper and Frederick Twenty. Uh, or sorry, that's according to Horace Cooper and Chuck Frederick, who write uh, um, in the uh, News Tribune, right? They write that judicial limits uh, heighten concerns of an over-politicized, all-powerful court. In fact, by making tenure per per uh, permanent, the Constitution ensures that co the court's makeup will not be changed according to the political interests of another branch. This is a central part of the balance of power, making the judiciary more dependent upon political branches, encouraging more political meddling, and risking that the court would um, decide cases politically. In fact, a regular confirmation cycle will lead to more individuals campaigning for openings and to use their votes to make themselves more attractive in a post-court world. Um, so that ultimately means um, that, yeah, this uh, sort of dependence, right, completely uh, undermines their whole, you know, kind of like democracy argument and so on and so forth, right? And of course, in addition to the fact that this, you know, independence and, and uh, with this uh, lack of independence and thus their ability, lack of ability to enforce the climate change provisions, we urge a negative balance. Thank you, open to cross. about um, like allocating appointments towards either side of the party. Um, you talk about how um, but how currently the courts aren't in balance, but how can you say that when when in the last um, 
since um, the um, oh yeah, since um, the since the sixties, um, we've the Democrats have only had four appointments versus the reps have appointed fifteen. How can you say that there isn't an imbalance? Yeah, I think so. The key thing is when we're taking a look at the actual rulings that have occurred, right? Because we can see that in general, we can see that for at least for the at least until recently, it's been a pretty good, right? Like four or five or five four balance that we have seen on the court, and this ultimately has resulted in what we would consider decent rulings. I think the key thing here to note is that there is something called ideological drift. How can you, drift can, where how can you say that these rulings have been decent? How can you say that these rulings have been decent when we've provided evidence to show that these recent rulings have been um, tr have tra have trended against public opinion? Yeah, sure. So I think, right, two things to that. I think first, um, specifically when we're talking about recently, like, yes, of course, we acknowledge the 6-3 conservative majority right now, right? But, uh, like, d discounting that, we can see in the past that has been the case. Second, we argue that um, um, in terms of public opinion, right, we argue that the point of the Supreme Court is not to protect public opinion, right? And that, in, that if their goal is to uphold so the how Constitution. how can you ensure that there's a public confidence in the court if the court's responsibility isn't to ensure that there's a good public opinion of the court? Yeah, sure. So we argue that the confidence, uh, right, because right, sometimes, you know, like this might uh, not necessarily be the case from the public, right, but we believe that the key thing is going to be the public will trust the Supreme Court, um, the Supreme Court's ruling as long as there's a high institutional trust in them, right? So we need to develop that institutional trust in the first place, and then so then to that sense, when the Supreme Court ultimately may go against public trust because that is what is, for example, constitutionally correct, the public is more willing to accept it. And that is exactly why uh, we need uh, the role of the Supreme Court. Um, but what, but but what, what evidence have you um, provided to to um, assert that um, there is a high, that uh, with the status quo, um, there is a high um, like public confidence in the court? Yes, I think right. So two things. So first, we've already uh, uh, my partner has already explained in his speech about our judicial independence is considered pretty uh, high around the world. Um, so that in that sort of sense of the word, uh, we can see that uh, of course it's pretty clear that if high judicial independence, especially compared to other countries, that will ultimately lead to a higher public confidence, first of all. And also, second of all, we um, also argue that, right, the key thing isn't necessarily about, like, you know, uh, it's uh, necessarily high in the status quo. The point is it would get worse under your world, right? Because all the negative has to prove is that it would get worse under your world. So as long as we can show that it would get worse under your world and public trust further decreases in your world, then we have proven our point, and the world of the status quo would be better uh, than the world of the app. Okay, and um, moving on, um, you had an argument towards the top of your speech about um, about um, like people um, wanting to seek other forms of employment versus um, remaining in um, within the court, of, um, remaining in the court um, with senior with a senior status. What evidence do you have you provided to um, as to say that um, it's more likely that they will assume other positions of employment? Yeah, so I think right. That's the thing is uh, we uh, we haven't provided any like for example, like current evidence, right? but we just use logic and previous examples, for example, from senators and so on and so forth, right? Okay. Because I mean, we, at least the way we see it is that this whole additional like, you know, like tenure clause is basically just a way to spike out of like, you know, you, you not have to use a con constitutional amendment, right? right? Which I mean, if you're part on, if that's what you want the time to be, that's fair. But also, right, we believe that, yeah, this is gonna be mostly just as a way to spike out of, you know, needing a constitutional amendment. And it doesn't actually ultimately result in Supreme Court justices actually using this option. Uh, and we argue that, again, that is not the case as argued in my speech previously. Okay. Um, there's 20 seconds left, so I just want to end that. Sounds good. Thank you.
ready and dry. And then roll it again. The affirmative team advocates for the adoption of 18 year term limits as outlined in 2023 by the Academy of Arts and Sciences. Once again, under this plan, which is adopted by a congressional statute, um, presidents appoint two new judges each term and justices serve actively for 18 years and um, they have the choice to either remain in office with senior status um, or um, leave the court. Under this system, the justices remain in office for the purposes of good behavior, even after their active service. Um, once, we, once again, we've outlined the, the um, harms of the status quo um, with the Supreme Court as, um, as um, them serving for, um, as like justices serving for long periods of time past their prime and, um, the, and, it, and the nomination process being partisan and politicized and the other issue of ideological imbalances associated with our tenure. And the um, affirmative team um, states that, um, the fir that through the AF, um, through the advocacy, um, this, ter this term limit um, framework reduces partisanship um, and, and restores legitimacy and preserves judicial independence um, and solves the harms um, recognized during the first affirmative speech. Um, and so now to answer some of their, um, the arguments on the negative side, um, the negative um, had an argument about, um, about justices vacating the court after um, their 18 year, um, um, their 18 year um, term. Um, however, um, when asked in Crawford what evidence they had to state that um, more the justices were more likely to um, seek other forms of employment versus staying in the court, um, the um, the negative evidence they just used logic. Um, however, um, however, um, however, that doesn't like there's um, that doesn't um, like there's still a chance that. Um, even after their 18 year term limit, that Supreme Court justices would stay within the court. Um, even more so, um, they are kind of, they're incentivized to stay in the court just because um, um, because they have um, that, that type of security by staying in the court. And um, so, um, yeah. And then on their argument about um, old judges um, being in the court, they had an argument about like healthcare, like improves healthcare, but that still doesn't, um, mean that there's there's going to be judges who um, without without a, um, term limits remain in the court past their prime and it, kind of in the same way through like the examples uh, mentioned such as like William O. Douglas, Thurgood Marshall, um, Chief the Chief Justice Rehnquist who like had um, like stroke who suffered through strokes and like terminal illness and um, and um, kind of declined the productivity of the court. Um, even with an improved healthcare, like those are still unavoidable issues. Like people still suffer from strokes and have terminal cancer today. So um, there's still a t um, through the plan. Not only does the plan incentivize younger justices to be elected, but it also um, ensures that justices aren't serve aren't active in the court past their own um, past their prime um, past their prime. And um, next. Um, um, on judicial um, independence, um, it says that um, right now um, the decline in court legitimacy and the status quo is an overall greater threat to judicial independence than um, than um, the um, than doing term limits. Um, this is kind of the biggest reason to, for the judge to vote for the affirmative, um, because um, even though um, and we also uh, because. Um, by allowing um, the president, each the president to elect, um, to, to giving the president two um, nominations or appointments each term, this kind of flexibility allows, um, prevents impasses on the Senate and um, gives the flexibility that kind of ensures this independent, that ensures independence um, of the ju judicial court. And um, I also wanted to extend um, the importance of, um, like um, of an ideological, like, um, life tenure or, or of term limits ensuring um, like solving for an ideological imbalance. Um, the, the negative kind of doesn't see this as an important point. However, um, we would like to say that um, in, it, with ever since um, 
the um, like empirical studies have shown that um, we've had a 75% to one party um, in, in balance since the, since 1937, and um, studies have shown that we've uh, through an 18 year term limit we've been able to re could in could reduce this imbalance by 50%, and this solves really harms for such as structural instability where. Um, we've had a conservative court reversing long-term standing um, precedents and um, and um, also um, because the court is losing um, public um, public the public is losing confidence in the court um, do ensuring um, that we have um, um, term limits to the Supreme Court um, kind of helps um, re reassure public uh, confidence in the court and um, motivates respect for the rule of law and um, just kind of to end my speech, um, I wanted to say that um, the reason to the vote to vote for the affirmative is to um, impose to um, is for um, eighteen year term limits um, for the Supreme Court. Um, once again, um, we've outlined reasons why this um, why like um, enacting eighteen year term limits is uniquely better for um, the status quo in terms of ideological imbalance. Um, a the, the partisan a po a po um, politicized um, nomination process and the negative hasn't offered any offense to why um, this is would be any worse for the status quo. And that's my time. Take a look at why this round is a clear negative ballot, right? They have three main points, uh, and we'll just quickly go through. Uh, take a look at how we respond to all of them, right? So first, they talk about this whole like age thing, right? First, the first response to it, we outweigh them because like literally, if we take a look at like their best, and they say like all Supreme Court just s s get like old and like mentally impaired, the short amount of years that they serve when they are impaired is always by the benefit they can provide with their experience for twenty and thirty years, twenty to thirty years, right? Even then, they also say uh, right, like, there's this whole thing on like you know, like oh judge like healthcare or whatever, but they can't solve like stroke or something like that, right? So first of all, we argue that um and that they remain in the court like past their prime, right? Again, we've already kind of responded to this, but I guess I'll just, re or we'll just reiterate our responses in that, like, even if, like, you know, like, they have, like, you know, like, certain, like, physical ailments, right? That doesn't mean that, like, you know, like, their mental capacity is so sharp or anything, because, like, yes, like, they might, like, you know, like, their, uh, like, their motor muscles within their mouth, like, might not be as functional as they were in the past, but that means they are just as sharp, right? Like, we're all, like, literally, like, university students, right? Like, I'm sure we have old professors that we realize are still, like, complete geniuses, right? Like, 
um, like, um, I guess, like, Gilbert Strang, who just retired from MIT, like, obviously, uh, even though, like, if you watch his last linear algebra lecture, like, it's clear, like, uh, you know, he had difficulty speaking, but, like, behind that, like, it's still very clear that he's still very innovative and able to keep on top of things, right? So just because, like, physically, like, they might appear older and frail or something, right, that doesn't mean that their mental state is not just as sharp, right? Um, so, yeah, we argue that, um, yeah, this is a really not unique, um, and then, yeah, right. Um, so then next on this like whole argument, like you know, like they say like they, they are incentivized to stay because it's like job security, right? Like we argue, right? Uh, first of all, like we already have enough money, so this really isn't a concern. I mean, just this get pretty pretty well. I um, mean, also like even then, right? Like the only reason they would stay is because they can't like take on another job. And in that case, I mean that the justices are old, right? And the justices are old. That means that you know you see their impact and talk about when the justices are old. So this is double bind for them, right? Don't let them have both worlds. It's either a you know justices stay in this like you know, like new like security secure position and like. Um, whatever, right, and they stay on the court as like an advisor or whatever, uh, but then that means that they're old because they can't take out any other job, or B, that means that they leave the court early and then we get all these corruption issues that uh, we talked about earlier and I'll go ahead um, and explain later, right? Um, yeah, that's it, we don't provide any evidence on that, why they would leave, yeah, like, yeah, we don't have like a card of evidence, but also at the same time, like, we prove with like logic and like, you know, like, with other examples like, you know, like senators leaving so on and so forth, like, the revolving door problem is very well known throughout the United States. I think it's safe to assume that this does occur. Um, okay, now continuing um, on, right, um, so, um, I guess a big point of offense for the negative side here um, is um, in terms of this DA, right? And their big response to this is that the court legitimacy and the status quo um, is a great respect to judicial independence, right? So first of all, we argue that they don't really, uh, they don't, at this point uh, in the round, they don't really prove uh, how they increase the court legitimacy. If anything, like they barely increase, and we increase uh, court legitimacy more by ensuring that this whole, like, you know, like corruption thing, and, like these like perverse incentives or whatever, right? These perverse incentives are more important to judicial leg legitimacy than whatever offense they might have remaining, right? Um, and yeah, right. So then they uh, then come with this like, new argument about terminal instability. First of all, you can just drop all your arguments, but I guess we can respond to it anyways. Um, yeah, we have evidence to say uh, how uh, we uh, and why we increase corruption more in that, right? Both like historical precedent proof and stuff. And also, we can't outweigh by saying like you no know, corruption uh, with like big corporations stuff. Like they will have too much money and will literally file justices, right? Like we explicitly state say why, like you know, like big law firms and other stuff will be especially important. The Supreme Court will be especially important considering that there is no private fan, right? In fact, India, which literally has a fan from Supreme Court justice going to private sector, again, this is all part of previously carded evidence. I read in my previous speech, literally they are already having issues with judicial independence and judges pandering to, in this case, the government, and in the United States it would be the private sector. So literally without a bad private sector and the massive amount of money that U.S. corporations and especially law firms have, right, this is going to become even more of an issue, and this absolutely um, is going to cause ruins, right? Um, so yeah, so term limit, um, and yeah, so um, yeah, so I think this is going to be the key thing here uh, because of the external motivations. That fundamentally means that when uh, things boil down to it, um, that means that um, yeah, they're going to, uh, their rulings won't, truly will not be independent anymore, uh, which again um, is contrary to their claims, um, and yeah, which will only further decrease legitimacy in the eyes of the public, um, and also lead to impacts, of course, uh, as we talk about this, envir uh, this environmental issue, uh, which specifically solves, uh, which we, again, the Marina and Mary Mabot evidence specifically mentions why uh, the Supreme Court uh, is key to environmental law, and of course, we know environmental law, um, environment, uh, and especially with the United States playing a leading role globally is really important. And we argue that any risk of envir environmental collapse means that you automatically vote for the neg because extinction is a categorically distinct impact and that it is the only non-reversible impact, right? So we argue that this categorically outweighs um, and we um, any sort of impact that they might have about like, you know, democracy or whatever if we still do give them the offense um, in that regard, right? Um, so fundamentally, yeah, we can't outweigh, uh, we outweigh using this corruption that we, um, and then, um, yeah, so yeah, so the big thing is, yeah, they don't uh, really respond to this whole like, corruption argument, which we say is going to be way worse because, like, um, yeah, like, literally every single justice uh, can be susceptible to it, uh, right? Um, and even then, right, uh, I guess we'll uh, yap yeah, a little bit more about the politics, right? So uh, the Farnsworth evidence um, that I mentioned earlier, uh, this is um, from the uh, U Texas School of Law, uh, right? This specifically talks about how, right, this inherently makes things more political because it's tied to the president, and so therefore, right, because each person gets to, right? So, like, oh, this, like, uh, whoever is uh, appointment, right? So therefore, right, like, this is going to be a part of a president's legacy, just like, you know, like um, other um, parts of a president's legacy exist. This would become another part of it because this is something that every single president gets to do, right? Like, for example, the State of the Union, every president gets four, all these things are important, which fundamentally means that this specifically is going to become tied to the president, uh, presidents, which inherently increases the politicization of it, and that, therefore, that dependence undermines um, uh, the de democracy of the court, right? Because now they become tied to this, uh, these foreign interests, right? Um, and then furthermore, I guess just on this whole like, you know, like confirmation hearings issue, I guess, right, we've already proved why, you know, like this is more tied to specifically the justice as nominated rather than like, you know, like, I guess the topic at hand by our examples of uh, Tobias G. Brown Jackson versus ACB uh, or Brett Kavanaugh, but also I guess just um, more broadly as a whole, right, um, you know, their whole evidence about like, you know, like, oh, like this is gonna become more normalized or whatever, right, we can see again, uh, right, the normalization, right, they don't prove like specifically why it's specifically unique to their specific um, 
the superior uh, right normalization occurs because it happens more often, right? We argue it would be just as contentious because right Republicans and Democrats they still hate each other, right? So fundamentally, in order to decrease the uh, in order to maintain the integrity of the Supreme Court, especially compared to the rest of the world, and to protect environmental regulations in the United States, Carlton, your name.